Uh, welcome to Authors at Google Talk. So today we're pleased to host Alex Kaliskov, who is uh, an expert in product and high-speed flash photography, and also a creator of Photogy.com, which is an online photography school. So today Alex will talk to us about the magic of light, and we'll actually do a live um, photo shoot demo for us of the high-speed splash photography. So please uh, join me in welcoming Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill. Uh, thank you, everyone, and hello. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to, to see me, to see what uh, we're going to do. Um, well, photography, it's a big part of my life, and uh, actually Google uh, has its own part of my heart, I would say. Uh, because it's a special company, I think, and I have some uh, uh, very kind of professional, personal uh, things to remember about Google. And uh, it's, for me, it's a big thing to talk to you right now. I'm a little bit uh, you know, nervous, but it should be okay once we start shooting, because this is what I do and love, and I forgot about everything. So first, let me uh, just show you a little movie, just to show how I love and what kind of photography I do, how I love it. And uh, it's all about, actually, the whole photo shoot about Google. I don't know, did you see or not behind the scene of making this shot? Who's seen it? Only a few. OK, cool. So you're not. This, uh, what I called, we did it for uh, first anniversary of Google+. Plus. Again, that was. I think very cool thing, Google Plus. Well, why was it is, but <laughs> it has changed a little bit. Anyway, uh, this is what we did for first anniversary. We made Google. So as you see, uh, that was several years ago. That time uh, we had the studio inside of the basement of our house. And uh, it was nothing fancy, I mean, in terms of equipment. Uh, but you see what kind of cool things you can do, even at home, when you're well, passionate about it. 
right now we have studio here, it's all uh, much nicer, but this is not what really a well, uh, passion photographer need to do something interesting and something cool. So let me tell you, uh, let me ask you about this. Uh, probably you have all have cameras, right? SLR, DSLR, don't even need to raise hands, you probably have it all. What kind of photography do you like? Please raise your hand if you uh, really enjoy doing landscaping. Awesome, probably more than 50%. What about uh, people photography, fashion and everything? Do you do it outside or inside? What about studio? How many think you shoot people in studio? How many of you shoot still life in studio? Okay, two, awesome. So it's very different. Every type of photography is very different and uh, of course we can talk about this uh, a lot but I'll try to do really simple kind of uh, division. Let's say for landscape photography, you need to be in the right place, in the right time, with the right gear, right? And then you will have a good chance to take something nice. If you miss one of those things, well, it's either too late, too early or uh, there is no sky or whatever, and then uh, you need to do it next time. This is for landscaping. When you shoot people, when you shoot uh, models and uh, anything, if it's outside, same conditions, right? If it's inside of the studio, meaning that you have much more control. You control your light, you control your background, you control environment. The only thing that you don't control is your model. You can influence, you can kind of communicate, but basically if, uh, let's say you need some emotion out of her or him, uh, and uh, for some reason it's not coming out, uh, what do you need to do? I mean, you kind of maybe stuck over there. I've been, you know, when I got my first camera, I started from landscaping, then it was people outside, then it was inside, and I just found that it's not really working well for me if I have some kind of limitations. So I was looking for photography without any external limitations. And this is where still life photography is. You control everything, literally everything. Camera, lighting, subject. Nobody will complain. He's not gonna complain if, you know, I will take me five hours to shoot him. He'll be fine. And in terms of impact from your photography, for example, uh, this people photography in studio, let's say. This one picture and uh, this is another picture. Same lighting setup. All the same except one thing, the emotion, right? Different emotion, completely different picture in terms of how it impacts us. But what you can do if you need to shoot a still life subject, emotionless, basically, and uh, you need to somehow reach to the viewer, make it you know, remarkable, make people to remember you, your photography. And uh, the only thing that you need to do is to walk with light. That's why I call it magic, magic of light. Uh, because in still life photography, we only walk with light. And I'm gonna demonstrate it to you in a few minutes, you know, from the beginning. Uh, it's another actual example of people photography, just something really beautiful. You don't need even much emotions, right? Eyes, for example, eyes attracts attention and boom, you have eyes on the image, people will, will look at it and probably you'll remember. Uh, but if we shoot something like this, just a bottle, and it should be pretty, pretty kind of plain shot, we're not going to prop it with anything else, maybe a little bit. All what you see is a light, the reflection or refraction of the light. So it's very technical type of photography, very technical. Uh, because, well, my background is bachelor degree in mechanical engineering a long, long time ago. And then uh, I was for 10 years uh, a programmer at one of US companies. So I'm an IT guy. And this is probably one of the reasons why kind of uh, really enjoying studio still life photography, because it's engineering. You're not going to work with emotions. You, you kind of, uh, it's, all, it's all very technical. So when you shoot simple subjects, simple things to make it, to make an impact, you need to work with light. Uh, just some examples. You probably know one of these things, right? So Google Glass, 
beautiful and simple thing, how to make something nice from it. Light. It's all actually uh, very little Photoshop here. Even that little uh, sparkles, it's, it's all done in studio. You can do uh, anything in light. Or like the jewelry. Again, this is basically as is shot. We just clean it and, uh, you know, it's not a composite shot. Uh, it's called diamond drop. Some telling story can be even happening uh, with product photography if you, well, make a story with it. Uh, for example, this very simple shot. One light source. And we didn't use Photoshop. Well, we used Photoshop to change uh, background color. That's it. Imagine how to shoot things like this just in one click. Yeah, it was not blue, but a gray background. Again, engineering the light. Uh, very cool things. Uh, motion. One of the things that I really enjoy to do stop motion photography. Uh, that's something, again, that makes impact on the viewer, especially in commercial photography. That's what they're looking for when they're looking for a photographer. Somebody who can make uh, images that will be, you know, will make impact. This one of the things, again, you can do motion and stop it. Uh, another shot. All of the shots, by the way, uh, wasn't done for commercial clients. We did it for lessons, for 40G, for that, uh, this online school that we have. Uh, probably only one in the world that really dedicated to studio still life photography. Everything we do, uh, it's all there. Uh, this vase, for example, it's a light painting. So it's a shot of the vase with strobe light. Within the same uh, click, it was one click, we added light painting. Pure technical stuff. <laughs> Magic, but it's all about uh, you know, understanding how light works and camera works. Uh, this is one click. Again, in Photoshop, we colored it uh, Steams and uh, Steams Green made in Photoshop. The rest was just out of the camera. Uh, about camera, iPhone vs Hasselblad. Who will guess where iPhone shot where is Hasselblad? And how? Actually, this is on the right, it's a Hasselblad. On the left, it's iPhone. You can only tell because iPhone has a wide angle lens. On the Hasselblad, I used uh, probably 120 millimeters iPhone. It's like 30 or so, right? And again, one, it's another proof that it's all about lighting, not about your camera. Uh, here it is. It's iPhone shot behind the scene. Simple. Yes, it's special program. It's not built in iPhone program, but that program, yeah, it led me to control shutter speed uh, and aperture and ISO. Uh, so, but nothing fancy. Okay, uh, this is footage. This is where all this behind the scenes happening. And the show time. Cool, we got in 15 minutes. This is how I look like when I do splash photography. <laughs> so we're gonna do some product photography here and some splash photography as well. I hope you gonna wear some protective clothes. I brought paint <laughs> and you'll be okay if I'll be throwing it here, no? <laughs> Okay, kidding. It will be water, but it will be um, really stop motion. So let's do uh, this. Colors mostly done in Photoshop, uh, even with the paint. Uh, for example, for Google, we try to use paint the correct colors, of course, uh, for, but to make it to match it really to the Google logo, uh, we did Photoshop correction of the uh, color. It's really easy. And of course, Lots of manipulation, as you've seen. Okay, so you shouldn't see anything. You didn't see anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, product photography. Let's start from something very, very simple. I brought some light, I brought a camera, and uh, I have this little plexiglass piece. And actually this is pre uh, the present from Cliff. This is present from Google which is, will work awesome for us. This is basically how you do the simplest people photography in the studio. You have a model and you have a light. And then you can put something here. Beauty dish, maybe some box, maybe nothing. So let's do a shot, let's try. Manual focus, by the way, if anyone really interested in this. Uh, of course, the tripod is not 
the real tripod, okay? This is not <laughs> what I use in studio. Uh, and video shot. So what do we have here? Let me do a little crop so you see a little bit better. Okay. So you see the subject, you, you can recognize it, right? You know that this little, uh, how you call it, Android, drone, or what is this? How you call it, guys? Okay. So if you add, for example, a little reflector from other side, it looks pretty nice. It's a little bit overexposed. Okay, a little bit overexposed, but you understand that this is not what's gonna change much if we uh, adjust the light. It still will be the same subject. If it will be my face there, you will recognize that, that hey, Alex Kolosko is here. So, when you want to, if you want to impress somebody with your still life skill, you know, I want to shoot, I can shoot some product uh, or any still life, please start, or not please, I'm, it's kind of uh, advice, okay? Start from matte subject, because this guy, it diffuses reflected light, it's matte. That's what we call the surface is matte, okay? And if we replace it with something really recognizable, I'm sure most of you, well, all of you know what it is, okay? This is a bottle of wine. We're gonna put it on the same place, maybe a little bit, no, it's all good. And we do a shot. I didn't change anything. What is going on? get to see the shape of your life. <laughs> Where's the subject? Where it is? If not the top of the bottle, you probably won't really know that this is the wine, right? There is something, and that's it. You see, I increased light uh, almost uh, one f-stop, two times brighter. It didn't help, except the top of the bottle, because the only part which is matte is on top of the bottle, right? So. Making light brighter doesn't work here, simply because it's glossy, glossy subject. It reflects everything, it reflects our light. It's like a mirror, right, but not flat. Tell me, when you standing in front of the mirror and you don't see yourself well, what do you do? You put lots of lights on the mirror? No, you lighten yourself. So. Here, the same thing. You cannot really highlight the subject. You cannot put lots of light and see something. You can only reflect something in it. Let's see what we can reflect. Diffusers, right? You know this diffusers, probably. This is basically semi-transparent, translucent, anything. This is plastic, for example. So let's do something very simple. Boom, we start seeing something, right? We start seeing the shape of the subject, a little bit, not much. Make it a little bit brighter. So it's more like a bottle now, right? But still not really bottle. If you don't know that bottle, you don't see the shape, you don't see that it's really cylindrical. And now, as any studio photographer, I'm going to shape the light. I'm going to create the shape of this bottle on a diffuser, so it will be just reflected. So see what I will do. First, we're doing this. Okay, I turn it off for a moment. I'm connecting other light. A little bit more serious light, brown color. Uh, but the ID is the same. And you probably already know what I'm gonna use, right? Softbox, or in this case, it's called strip box because it's narrow, but basically it's softbox. Everyone knows what's inside, right? No? So it's a diffuser. You mount light on this side, right? This is special ring for special type of lighting for brown color, for example. And inside you have this, okay? It's a glossy box cover it with kind of foil. It has some diffuser inside and one more diffuser uh, on this edge. So it's really, the whole idea of this is to produce uniform feeling 
of this surface. That's it. And when we mount in our light. Okay. Let's see what will happen. I have a trigger, but a very handy thing. Okay. Now we kind of start seeing more, right? It's more like a bottle. But still, the shape of the bottle is not really visible. You can guess what kind of shape of this bottle is. Simply because we have in one to one, of course, size is changed because it's not a flat mirror, but we have a reflection from this guy, from, the, from our diffuser, from the strip box. Uh, let's see if I will add just a larger. This is the same thing, a larger soft box. What will happen? Okay, we see more of the bottle, much more. Now, what's the difference between this and this? beside the shape of the light. How do you know if your subject is glossy or not? On the picture, how do you know? Does this look glossy? I can actually crop it a little bit so you see a little bit less. And it's actually, it's a little bit fallen inside, but not a problem. So, for me, it doesn't look glossy. This look glossy. The previous shot is not looking glossy. However, glossy, because it's kind of, it reflects something bright, we know it, but it's not showing shape. So we need to show the shape of the bottle. It's cylindrical. Do you know when you drawing things, how to make from a circle to make a sphere? Right? You, you, you're creating shadow, maybe. You're creating some highlights and some, basically, it's a gradient, gradient, right? If it's, it's a you know, flat paper, you're creating a gradient. And for us, it looks like, hey, there is some 3D coming, right? It, it takes, I mean, it creates a shape. So I'm going to create a gradient over here because I cannot do it here, right? For example, when it's matte, you remember our little guy? We have a gradient, like here. We have brighter, darker areas. We see that it's, it's a cylinder, basically. It was not a problem, but on the glossy stuff, you don't see that it's, uh, it's cylindrical. You cannot see it, so you need to create it here. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a gradient. How do it? If I touch diffuser with one side of the light on this strip box, it will be brighter, sharp, well, it will be sharp cut off, right? It will be brighter area, and then it will be gradually, the brightness will fall off naturally, right? So let me do this. You see how I turn it the light a little bit, and I do the shot. Okay, we can do it. Even more like this. Okay, gradient. This is where it comes to the life. Depends on how good you are. When we create an ingredient, we start seeing that, hey, this is how gradient looks like. It's like half of the shape, but it starts, right? It's like same as you would paint this bottle. Now we just need to add another side, right? Kirill, can you help me? I'm gonna ask assistant for this shot, Kirill. Uh, help me uh, to, this is, show it, just a piece of foam core board. So white reflector, not even diffuser. And Kirill is going to hold it from other side, make it vertical and closer, awesome. Far away, a little bit farther. <laughs> okay, actually the previous shot is completely fine because you're gonna crop it. It's easy to crop, right? And he didn't touch the subject, kind of touched, so it's fine. But you see what's happening. We start seeing the bottle, okay? It's relatively kind of simple shot, just, thank you, thank you, Kirill. Just showing you the approach of how we shoot still life. 
we examine the subject. This is a simple one, very simple. And I didn't finish because if I'm going to finish, we may miss some other stuff. Uh, because, for example, uh, the bottom of the bottle. What it is? What this nasty reflection is? Do you know? No, the bottom. You see, it's not coming the, the reflection from our uh, reflectors, diffusers. It's not go coming all the way to the bottom of the bottle. Exactly, table. So the whole process of still life photography, it's understanding where the light or where that reflection is coming from. So you just need to understand. I see so many uh, times when people struggling to get, for example, age reflection on something like this. Where to put light? They put in light and it's not on the age. Again, the whole idea is to understand what do you see, where is, the light, where is your light is reflecting and where you need to move your light maybe to get age reflection. For example, where, knowing the shape, the light for the age reflection should be if you want to have tiny edge on this. Top, no, no, if edge on the side. On top, it will be like this. Let's play. I really love to play with light, holding it like this. So, on top, what did you get? Of course, this surface reflects something on top, nothing behind. And we start moving it behind, this is where, well, it's kind of hitting the camera, so we need to turn it away from the camera. Right, this is where this edge reflection is coming from. And you see, I can in shoot like this. It will be still edge reflection because of the angle. It's a law of reflection, very easy, simple. You just need to understand how the shape, you know, based on the shape of the subject, where it's reflecting and what it's reflecting. So, this is why I love studio still life photography. I can spend hours uh, to shoot complex subject because this is a simple one. Uh, when it has mixed of glossy, glass, meaning transparent stuff, matte, the, you know, the way that you highlight it is, it's like, I don't know, uh, like a maze. I mean, you, you, you can do a lot and uh, <laughs> uh, learn a lot uh, while switching this about the light. One more thing, just to test you. How I fix this reflection on the bottom? How to make a uh, reflection to go all the way to the bottom of the bottle? Say again? One thing, correct. So table, because this is reflection from a table. Uh, is what we see. Another thing, if you still want to, well, it's probably be the same. What I do with this instead of moving, I can move my camera lower, right? You understand, when we shoot in some cylindrical, a little bit from top, it reflects at some point the table. If I move it almost like from the bottom, a little bit, probably a little bit more. you won't see the table at some angle, of course. Oops. Okay, so almost at the bottom. Just and again, just one of the examples of how to deal with all those reflections. Let's try to finish the shot. What we can do is this. We can put a background light. You know it when you work with models. It's also one of the coolest thing is to separate your subject from the background. And if subject is dark and background is dark, the only way to separate it, beside creating the edge reflection, right, the rim light, is to just make a spot on the background. So let's try to do this. Let's see how it will work. Okay, again, cropping it. Then making nice reflection. 
let's see how it will come. Okay, a little bit closer. You see what I'm doing? If I want to remove that gap on top of the bottle, well, I'm probably getting too, too technical. Don't you think? No? <laughs> Didn't get it yet. More. Okay, almost. It looks like my tripod. This is my new tripod for travel. Uh, not made for Hasselblad and it's gonna start floating. So Kirill, let's finalize the shot. Please be my holder for the reflector one more time. And now I rotate it bottle more to, I mean, I'll rotate the label, showing the label and uh, let's do a shot. Okay. Kirill, a little bit further. It's a little bit too much light. Okay, so with two lights, probably it's the best way to shoot bottle. Of course, I would need probably third light uh, to make a little bit better reflection for the label, but we're gonna stop on this. Now I'll show you a little bit of splash photography, okay? I'm gonna make, I'm gonna put a glass. Because it's similar shape, right, to the bottle, the lighting setup with this, which we kind of created should work for us, at least at some point. Because one more thing that I see, uh, you know about Strobist Info? That Strobist, you know, the guy, Strobist, Strobist.com, uh, they created this nice culture of basically telling behind the scene the kind of setup of uh, how uh, they took a picture. Usually it's a portrait show or some out, outdoors shot. And usually they're saying like this, one light on the right, uh, second light from top or above or a little bit from left, for example. And it's enough for people to understand how to take that type of portrait. With this light, you see how little change of position in the diffuser or light, your light, let's say, uh, changing the angle, it affects picture so much that basically there is no way to memorize lighting setups for still life photography. Yes, you can memorize how I just shoot a bottle and can actually shoot it much better, but using the same technique. But if your bottle will be not a straight cylinder, but a little bit like that, you know what I'm saying? It's not gonna work. <laughs> well, you need to modify the lighting setup to make it work for, for that bottle. If bottle is like a spherical, again, it's not gonna work. The only thing to, to be successful at still life photography is to understand how light you know, comes to the camera, where it's coming from, what kind of reflection do you see? Is it reflection or refraction? For example, now we're gonna see some refraction, probably, right? We can see through uh, our subject. Let me replace it with different gel. Sometimes it's cool to have colored light. Again, one of those emotional things in still life photography when color can help you to bring some something. So, our glass. And let's have some magic. One of the magic comes from fake things, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> Uh, in still life photography, same thing. This is fake ice. It's a beautiful acrylic fake ice cubes. And uh, well, you've probably seen those advertising pictures with uh, some alcohol, probably with uh, little uh, glass filled with that alcohol on rocks, right? So this is what they use. It's not real ice because it's gonna melt and it will be, well, it's hard to get it uh, transparent. Here it's easy. One piece actually cost $40, just, you know, for you. So let's fill this thing with the ice.
Okay. Again, we can try. Actually, we need this. We can try to add a diffuser because same as this bottle, we see some sharp reflection. But again, this looks already not bad because it's transparent. It's semi-transparent. We can see uh, something behind it. If we add thing like this, maybe even rotate a little bit our glass, we can get some better look. I would say. You see with gradient, it's kind of start looking better. Especially if you make a little bit closer look. This is sharp cut off line. You can see it, right? And uh, uh, the eyes looks nice. How would you emphasize the, eye, the, the texture of the eyes while minimizing the glass reflection? Uh, well, probably for this shot, I would put a light behind it, some spotlight, hitting it like this. On a glass, it will probably make one little spot somewhere, bright spot. If it will be a sharp light, meaning that uh, it will be uh, something with honeycomb grid, okay? Spotlight, basically. But on the eyes, because of the shape, it will probably create some lots of interesting reflections, refractions. That's how you can see. Is this what, what's your question or? Okay. Now stop motion. Yeah, almost time for questions and answer. Do you guys have a question? Do we have things to talk about when I'm done? Because we may, have, we may shoot for 15 minutes or we can, I don't know, shoot for five and talk to 10. Okay, I'll try to do it uh, as fast as possible. Uh, let me do, it's simple. Uh, let's do it simple. I need it in my hand. Usually in studio, I may use some special trigger. There is a trigger which, you know, it can be triggered by sound or triggered by light, meaning that if I have a, some tiny light going through this way and throw the liquid, when I intersect that line of sight, you know, like in garage door opener, it will trigger the light. However, it's possible to do it just with hand, if you have practice, of course. So how do it? This way or that way? Okay. So I'll try. Oh, one thing. To make it uh, more chances to be successful at this, I do this. Do you know what I did? Exactly. Mirror flip, meaning that it will, I press it immediately without any delay, take a shot. So mirror look up, right? This is how it looks like, um, named. Let's try. Three, two, one. Boom. Okay, so we got something. We got something which already look emotional, right? Oh, I see. It's like this is one of the things that easily can bring emotion to the still life shot. Something which you cannot see with the naked eye, right? This is one of the things that you usually don't see in real life. Here you can freeze it and uh, see something. But let's examine it. Boom. What is going on? How fast is your flash? One second. You see, it's blurry. It's all blurry. I have a focus. What's going on? It's motion blur. And well, I have, uh, what's the shutter speed? One four hundredth of a second. I can go up to eight hundredth of a second, but it's not going to help. Because with speed light, with uh, high speed photography, we freeze in motion, not with the shutter at least in studio, but with the light. Because without light, this picture will be completely dark. Take a look at this. Just took a picture. Here, what we see with ambient light on given exposure, right? It's dark, well, very few highlights from those spots, spotlights. So the only light that we have is our strobe. And if strobe impulse will be short enough Camera will capture only the time when it fires. So the whole idea is to, in our case, change the mode of the strobe from normal, kind of color, constant color, to uh, high speed. Brown color can do it, Profoto can do it, Paul Sebaf Einstein can do it, speed lights immediately have it. All the speed lights, battery powered little speed lights, very short flash duration and lower power settings. 
again, if you want to learn more about this, uh, 40G is the answer. So let me do this. Minimum. So it went from 1 1700th of a second to 1 5600th of a second. Okay, this light, and same for this light. Oh, actually, this light is good as well. It's already 1 6, 6, 6, of a second. And let's do this shot again. Okay, we will be lucky this time. Well, sort of. Now let's try to do a few more. Because it's interesting that with flash photography, when you throw in the liquids, technical side usually is very easy. Once you get it, kind of what, how to set that light, uh, you put some light modifiers for the subject, it's all easy. The hardest part, and probably the most interesting part, is the shape in the splash. Because, you know, everyone can do like, like I just did. But to do that Google and uh, well, uh, you, things that you will see in my portfolio, it takes so much time to just train your hand to throw something interesting that, well, it's cool. It's almost like a painting. You paint and it looks like a crap. You paint again and crap. So you need to kind of learn and do it again and again. Uh, oops, I think it was too early, right? Yeah, it's coming this way. Well, you know, let's do uh, things in a focus plane. You understand, if I throw in this way, part of the splash may be out of focus because this is our focusing plane, right? Uh, so I'll do it this way. No, too early. Well, I was surprised for the first time how I kind of got it. It was like, wow. But there is a price for this, right? Okay, so let's see. Let's see how it looks like. Well, it's a little bit out of focus, but basically there is no motion blur where things are in focus. And of course, this light is a little bit uh, too bright for this. So we need a diffuser. Krill, will you help me? I want to get you wet a little bit for the last shot and we have Q&A. Please hold this uh, like that, okay? And I'm gonna throw water at you. Because it's not fair, I'll be wet, he's not, no. Okay, like this. So it will create a gradient, right? Let's see, am I right or not? Okay, Kirill, you have yourself somewhere. Oh, it's me. <laughs> Come on. It is Kirill, but it's not. Okay, so a little bit of gradient. Maybe even do like this, okay? Okay. Ooh, even better. Nah. I want to fly it on top. Yeah, like this. And then I want to hit it and it will be last shot because the bottle is gone. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Almost, thank you. Oh, actually no, it, it hit, right? We did it. We did it on this side. Yeah, not really visible, uh, but we did it. But all this flying liquid can look really nice when, uh, when it's in the frame. Okay. This is in short how all still life, you know, commercial studio photography looks like. Uh, photographers sit in quiet environment usually with very few people around and can spend hours or days sometimes to, to get uh, something really nice. It was like this, but then Photoshop came to the game. Uh, then, you know, 3D Max uh, and all this 3D software. Now you can do, <laughs> you either can spend time shooting it and making the light, or you can just grab one light, 
hold it, shoot several shots, you know, walking around the subject so you have all kinds of reflections and then put them together in Photoshop, composing the shot and, you know, erasing some parts. So it's kind of really crazy uh, and uh, there is no right or wrong way to do it. That's it. Any questions? Let's talk about it. Thank you. Hi, sorry, you may have mentioned this earlier, but what shutter speed are you using? Because um, when I've tried to do anything with motion before, I feel like the sync speed limitation of like 200 or 250 gets in the way of this. So I'm curious, is this because you're using a Hasselblad or, is, or are you just using a regular sync speed? Okay, I got it. So it's about X sync speed, right? Uh, of the camera. Hasselblad has uh, leaf shutter and that's why uh, X-Sync speed is equal to the maximum shutter speed actually, 1 800th of a second. For DSLR it's not the case, in most cases. <laughs> and with DSLR we shoot at X-Sync speed, usually it's around 1 200th of a second. And it's not a problem because shutter stays open for 1 200th of a second, completely open. You understand the difference between X-Sync and uh, uh, faster. If let's say you shoot one four thousand of a second shutter speed, shutter is not gonna open and close for one four thousand of a second. No, it's not working this way. It will make a little gap and move this gap across the frame, exposing it like line by line basically. That's how it creates uh, one four thousand of a second, for example, shutter speed effective. But in reality, uh, it moves much longer time. So X sync, it's the, uh, the fastest shutter speed when it opens completely. When it opens, that's what we need. We can use high speed strobe. It can be speed light. The least expensive is just a speed light. If you put your speed light into one fourth of full power or less, but not more, it will give you about once for thousand of a second T.1. I'm not going to talk about this, this technical uh, ways of measure it. Basically, it will give you really short flash duration. Like this, we have one six thousand of a second, right, with those lights. So this what frees it. And we shoot at X-Sync speed. If you're gonna, again, I don't have uh, DSLR, but if I would shoot with the same lighting setup with one eight thousand of a second, I will get just little, actually it will be like this, little part of our frame is highlighted. The rest will be completely dark because it's behind the curtain. Hi, uh, the tool you're using to like uh, throw the water, it seems like, can you talk about that, like how it like shapes the, uh, the water you're throwing? Yeah, this is uh, patented technology. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funnel. Uh, I, I kind of stuck some um, sort of Play-Doh. Uh, so it's, it's not, it works as a cap. But yeah, in throwing splashes, the shape of uh, the thing that you have liquid on, it's very, well, it's changed the shape a lot. Really, with this thing, I can easily do C-shaped splashes. I just didn't do it because it's like uh, a relatively tight frame, but I was experimenting. There are so many things that you can, uh, you know, put the liquid and throw it. I don't know, did you see it or not? Uh, again, don't have it much here. I may show you later. Like, I have a splash where three colors collide and kind of mixing. And it's, it wasn't Photoshop, it was real three colors filled with something like this where I divided it by three sections, three different colors of paint. Oops, I throw it and in the air it sucks really nice. So it's, it's about shaping the splash, part of it. Uh, what liquids do you use for a colored and a matte um, liquid, like splashes rather than a, a transparent glossy water? Oh, what, what, uh, what dye, what ink? You, yeah. You, uh, we either use already mixed, if it's uh, something non, uh, should be non-transparent, we use just paint, latex paint, acrylic paint, different colors. Uh, but if uh, we need something transparent, semi-transparent, we use just um, food coloring. So in any grocery store, uh, it should be clear. There are different ones. Uh, clear is better, but yeah. And in addition to this, sometimes you need to change the viscosity of your liquid. And if you want it to be like a water-like, it's a secret, but I tell you, we use a glycerin. Glycerin, uh, you can buy only buy a big can of it, relatively expen non-expensive compared to what you can buy, you know, in pharmacies. And uh, you mix it with water, and you can kind of get any viscosity. You can have thicker, thinner, just based on uh, the ratio. 
In some of the shots in uh, your portfolio on the web, there were almost surfaces of water where they were, uh, or liquid, where they were apparently lit from both below and above. Is that just the strip light spanning the difference, or do you have more complex lighting configurations for some of these? When liquid is like a sphere, right? Yeah. Okay, we throw it, and it gets this way. And uh, that we did actually on the, this workshop that we had uh, here in California first time. When we have enough room, you can throw, and if liquid is thick enough, you can throw it, it will fly like something, uh, you know, without any form. And then at some point, you've probably have seen it, when you throw in liquid, let's say from second floor, it flies, 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 and then it bursts, right? You've seen that effect when it's like, if you put big, you know, like bucket of big, uh, liquid. Before it happens, before that burst, it starts inflating like a balloons itself. So it starts going like this, and if you catch the moment when liquid goes, you know, just before it bursts in, that's what happens. That's what we do with liquid. It's truly, it's, it's amazing, you know, techniques, what you can do with, you know, motion. So uh, how do you get, get started with splash photography? What is the minimal setup you need? Like, uh, speed lights. Uh, I have one speed light, you can start with splash photography. Uh, let me tell you, the fastest way to start with splash photography is just one speed light. Have a white background, white wall, whatever. Put that speed light, uh, put some uh, honeycomb grid on it, better uh, around it, so it'll have, create a spot, okay? Put a glass in front, so it's enough uh, for the glass, for example, to have only one light, to be on the background and it will be visible, right? Because it's transparent. I'll show you. One demonstration worth a thousand words, right? Well, it's a little bit too dark, but you see the idea. Do a setup like this with one light and then throw something on that uh, glass. You will see nice splash. This is technically. If, I don't know, did you ask about business side, but in business you need to do a lot, a lot, a lot, fill your portfolio with something really cool and then start reaching <laughs> out. All right, uh, so we're out of time. Let's uh, thank Alex again for this presentation. <laughs>